I'd like to introduce Greg Autry, because uh, he's a great guy. And uh, so first of all, as I, I mentioned last night, uh, we owe uh, this conference uh, to Greg Autry, who arranged for us to get this uh, magnificent facility under extremely reasonable terms. So I just, once again, thanks, Greg, for that. And, uh, but there's a lot more to him than that. Okay, Greg has long been an advocate of uh, commercial space uh, and in uh, uh, facilitating the development of this spaceflight revolution that we're seeing unfolding right now, which is something that can make all our dreams possible and is necessary to make all our dreams possible. And furthermore, um, he has been willing to wade into the nitty gritty of politics and, you know, while Greg and I have some disagreements upon how certain things are being implemented, and we had a debate on that the other night, uh, you know, the one real breakthrough that we have had with this administration was putting a deadline on getting something real done in space, and that is his work. So thank you, Greg, and let's hear what you have to say. Bob, could I get you to come back up? I, I, I want a picture. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that warm introduction. And uh, I'm really glad to have all of you here. Um, I host a Southern California Commercial Space Flight Initiative workshop each year, which kind of brings academics and space uh, industry and policy people together. And last year I co-hosted it with the National Space Society and the Moon Village Association. And this year I was really proud to have you guys. You've been a credit to the space world and, uh, and, and thank you. Um, you are here. <laughs> uh, I, lo I love this picture uh, taken from the, uh, the Earth uh, Sun uh, L1 point uh, with the uh, the epic camera that uh, actually shows the the backside of the moon there and uh, in Southern California really nicely. I couldn't be with you guys yesterday because I was with the. Uh, folks at uh, the USC Rocket Propulsion Lab uh, at the, the Coliseum for our, our football game uh, where uh, the school nicely uh, showed their rocket launch up on the Jumbotron and the, the students there were really excited and, and uh, my son and other people made me go. So I'm really sorry I couldn't be at the banquet and, and again, I, I thank, thank Bob for, for, I understand there was a shout out there because somebody sent me the video. So. Thank you. Um, but there's so much exciting stuff going on into space, it's almost impossible to know where to be, right? So you've got ISC coming up this week. I missed ISPCS in New Mexico. I feel bad about that. Um, but this is a really good sign. Things are happening in space, uh, and they're happening dynamically and in an uncoordinated way. It's not all dictated from, from Washington, D.C., right? Uh, I love Washington, D.C., honestly. I, I hosted the ISDC conference there uh, in June as chair, and. Uh, and that was fun. And I think a lot of our policymakers, in a bipartisan way, are starting to get it about space. Uh, I love seeing U.S. senators uh, that actually do personally care about space. Um, a couple of months ago, I was in the Orange County Airport, and I ran into Ted Cruz and the McDonald's and uh, started talking. And we ended up on the same plane together uh, heading out to Houston where I was giving a talk. And, you know, the, guy, the guy's passionate about it. Whether you agree with him on anything else, you know, he's passionate about that. I, I've had the opportunity to, to sit and talk with the, the new Democratic chair of the uh, uh, SciTech committee, and she's passionate about it. And uh, I don't agree with her or him on every single point, but the, the point is that a lot of different people are thinking about it from a lot of different angles. And when that happens, I think good things are going to happen. Now, I'm most particularly interested in the commercial industry, and I want to talk about this. So you would think that these young people who, who built a rocket about 1,000 feet from here and actually sent it to space uh, from a dry lake bed in Mojave about, uh, I think, 60 miles from here um, wouldn't necessarily make, make a big impact, uh, you know, beyond uh, – this, this stunt. I'm sure a lot of people just looked at it as a stunt. So yeah, they had a, a solid rocket that crossed the Carmen line with a GoPro in it with, with a really bad video because they cut the port out of the, uh, the rocket where they put the GoPro in a kind of fuzzy way. And somebody got a fingerprint over the lens and that just kind of happens with, with student things. But they did it, right? Uh, no, it did make a big impact in ways that you might not think about. And I want to talk about the commercial impact of this little rocket lab here. And this is a entirely student-run 
place. If you walk into that, that, that lab, in fact, Bob, have you been there? Uh, let me see if I can get in there. Yeah, if you have, a, you, okay, well, never mind. Next time we're going to go in there. All right, you should see this. You wouldn't think that much if you looked at, at what, at, you know, the facilities and equipment in there and watch these kids take uh, the AP and kind of pack it together in a big mixing bowl like it was uh, bread dough or something by hand. But uh, uh, they're doing incredible things. And so I'm going to talk about two spinoffs that came out of uh, uh, RPL. Uh, one is this one. Some of you might have seen me uh, riding around on that skateboard there. So I'm actually the uh, the skateboarding professor, which saves me a lot of time when Carrie texts me and says that we, we have some technical problem in one hall or the other. So there we go. Um, this student here, Ryan Ologis, uh, was the head of composites for the, the Student Rocket Propulsion Lab. And he came into my office one day. He had made a skateboard out of the leftover carbon fiber scrap, uh, the prepreg material from from an RPL rocket that he was working on. And he had built his own press. He had put in his own heating elements, developed his own heating controller, used some automotive bottle jacks to, to get the compression on it. And he showed me the skateboard. I'm like, wow, first of all, I, I skateboard, so that's cool. And second of all, it, it's made out of rocket material. And third of all, I happen to be really connected in the commercial space industry. I know people that are throwing out literally millions of pounds of this material. Because when you, uh, when you lay out carbon fiber, it comes as a cloth. And it's a rectangle. It gets spread out on a, a cutting table, and uh, an ultrasonic uh, cutting head uh, automatically cuts out the shapes that you need in order to make the curves on your payload fairing or your interstage or your landing legs or whatever you're making. And all of the excess material, the scrap material, the trim scrap, goes in the trash, just like if you cut a T-shirt out of uh, fabric that negative space goes away. So 30, 40 percent of that material is going in the trash. And I'm like, wow, we could solve this problem because this stuff is indestructible, right? It's an environmental nightmare. If you don't like plastic uh, in your landfill, you, you don't want prepreg carbon fiber. Uh, uh, not that it's toxic or anything, but it just it, it's designed to, to be really tough, so it's not going to decay. Uh, so anyway, I helped uh, Ryan actually turn his idea into a business. Um, crazy me, I put in over $100,000 in my own money. Uh, and, and then I, <laughs> my wife's like, what? Skateboard company? <laughs> Last time I had invested in space, I put about $100,000 into developing the Dream Chaser when it was back at a company called uh, Space Dev in San Diego. And uh, uh, anyway, that, that didn't work out well for me either. But it, I, I love the Dream Chaser, and at least something's happening. Um, so anyway. Uh, we did some really cool things with the skateboard. In fact, we launched or flew using a balloon, the first skateboard, to the edge of space out of Mojave and took this really cool photo. And uh, the business has done pretty well. Uh, he sold over 3,000 skateboards. We've actually raised $1.3 million now in, in, in total money right now. Uh, on our, our board includes uh, Michael Lopez Alegrea. If you don't know who he is, he's uh, one of America's uh, premier astronauts, ISS commander. He's kind of the George Clooney character from Gravity. He holds the, uh, the US uh, EVA uh, records. Um, and uh, we've got uh, Dan D'Amico, the former chairman of Newcore Steel, which is America's largest recycling company and the largest steel company in the US now. And he put in over $300,000. Um, and we've got, uh, hello, advance, advance. We've got a lot of different products. These drums, one of our investors is a guy named Jimmy Keltner. Does anybody know who Jimmy is? Rock and roll uh, top session drummer. Uh, Rolling Stone magazine he says he's number 36 out of the top 100 drummers. He played drums on Imagine. He played for Dylan. He was the drummer for Traveling Wilburys. We're making these drums for Drum Workshop that he hooked us up with out of carbon fiber collected from the space industry. I'm not allowed to say what companies they are, but their local companies here that use a lot of carbon fiber. And um, these drums, in fact, are, yeah, these drums, in fact, are being played on uh, the new Beck album. We made carbon fiber bow ties. Uh, Ryan's made a carbon fiber sit stand desk. He's making frames for drones for racing drone companies uh, out of uh, Singapore and Taiwan. And he's, uh, which is great because we're actually exporting uh, American products uh, to the rest of the world, which is kind of cool, net trade balance. Um, 
making uh, drone frames for a large company that can't be named that would like to deliver products from their very, very large e-commerce site to, uh, to your homes. Okay. Uh, then at our Southern California Commercial Space uh, Flight Initiative workshop the other day, I was happy to have your very own uh, Bob Zubrin uh, join a panel that included Jordan Noon next to him and Garrett Reisman, uh, formerly of SpaceX, formerly a NASA astronaut, now a USC professor, and I'm happy to say I helped work that deal a little bit, uh, narrated by the esteemed Rod Pyle of National Space Society. Um, and you know, the thing I love about Bob is, is Bob's got his books there. Bob is a space entrepreneur, okay? He is not just a, a, a brilliant uh, engineering mind. He is always out there hustling, and, and I, 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 I totally appreciate it. It's how we get things done in this industry, okay? But Jordan, Jordan's like 20-something, right? He came out of the rocket propulsion lab. He and Ryan worked together on the Traveler 4 rocket uh, uh, that, that went to space. And Jordan went off and, and did an a internship at Blue and did about a year at SpaceX and then decided he would found his, his own company. We were proud to give him the award of Space Entrepreneur of the Year uh, on Thursday. And Relativity, how many of you are familiar with Relativity? Okay, if you're not, you should be. Uh, what does relativity do? It's different. Yeah, so they 3D print their whole rocket, not just the engine. A lot of people are now printing a lot of components and even major uh, constructions of engines. Gosh, even when I went to Marshall Space Flight Center and Todd May took me on a tour of the SLS stuff, they're actually printing about 25% of the replacement components for the RS-25 now. Um, so if they can do it, anybody can do it. But relativity is trying to print the whole darn rocket, which gives you all sorts of interesting scalability options and to be able to change uh, the vehicle and go from essentially a, a CAD design to a, a flying rocket in less than 60 days, hopefully. Uh, and they're building the world's biggest 3D printers. Very cool stuff. There is Tim Ellis. Again, these guys are 20-something, right? Uh, they have raised uh, almost $200 million total. Their valuation isn't public, but they're pretty close to being a unicorn at 20-something. Um, and that is just astounding what's coming out of the commercial space industry. And I can tell you, I, I'm uh, excited to say that somebody managed to get Tim Ellis on the user advisory group in the National uh, Space Council. So if you look at that user advisory group, it's like Buzz Aldrin and the CEO of Lockheed and the CEO of Boeing and the CEO of every other big company. And nobody under there on that thing is under 60, right, except for, for Tim Ellis. That, that's pretty cool. And the people in, in D.C., in the military, and at NASA are, are excited about what Relativity is doing. Um, and, in fact, they've, they've got a big uh, test stand at Stennis where, where they've actually been testing their engines. And they've uh, leased three other facilities from, from NASA. They're going to build a, a very large uh, spaceship factory at, uh, at Stennis. And the Air Force has given them a pad at, at the Cape. And they've got enough money, they're going all the way to orbit. And kids that, actually, I started working with Jordan when I think he was 17, right? And I just said, this, this kid's going far. He is now going to fly things to orbit. I, I'm so damn pleased by that. Now, this brings up an interesting question, though. Is, is this a government subsidy, cash cow sort of thing that uh, is going to distort the market? Or... Is it a positive thing for commercial space? And, and there's a line there. I know a lot of people in this community are kind of on the libertarian side, and then there's a, probably a smaller faction that's kind of over on the socialist side. And I don't think we get a lot of moderates in the, the space industry. People tend to, uh, to be passionate about however they view the world. Um, but this is an interesting topic, and it makes me want to ask the question, uh, what, what is the, uh, the proper role of government? Right? What should government policy do? And my response is that the purpose of government is to improve the lives of the most people. Okay? In some countries, you've got a government whose purpose seems to be to improve the lives of an elite group of people. And occasionally here, uh, we have that problem too, but if we have corrective mechanisms whereby uh, we, we, we try to fix that issue. But, you know, the, the proper role of government should be to, uh, to make things better. This, begs the question, though, where, where are the most people? Uh, and think about this. Where do the most people live? Do they live in Europe? Do they live in the United States? Do they live in China? No. Do they live in India? No. 
They live in the future. The role of government is to improve the lives of people in the future. Okay? Stop worrying about ourselves. It's, it's all about the next generation. It's one of the reasons that I'm here teaching. Honestly, I could do other things, but I, I love what I do, and I get to, to hang out with kids like Ryan and Jordan who are brilliant and, 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 and uh, participate in their success. But what I really want to do is improve the lives of people in the future, and I think that that's why this society exists primarily. How many of you actually think you're going to get to Mars? God bless you. I hope so. Uh, I'm not as enthusiastic, but somebody is, and if you keep doing it, it's, it's going to happen, okay? So uh, let, let's try to make it you and me, but uh, if not, uh, you know, let, let's make it my son. So this brings up an interesting point, uh, why, why the moon, okay? Uh, when we were at uh, NASA, I was with the transition team. Um, this was an issue. Um, it would become apparent that there are some resources. And this isn't just water ice. If you watch, for instance, a recent uh, interview with Phil Mesker, you'll see that uh, we know that there's carbon there too. So we've got CO2 ice perhaps. Uh, you can make methane with that if there's enough of it. There might even be methane ice. There's also likely, uh, based on radar imaging, uh, some large metallic cores from asteroids that impacted the moon. We're not clear on that. Those might have been vaporized when they made the craters or, or not. We need to, to do uh, some ground penetrating radar, but we've got radar that's demonstrated we can find those meteorite and asteroid cores on the Earth, so let's, uh, let's do that on the moon. But the point is people want to get to this stuff, and uh, if we don't participate in getting to this stuff, we're not going to have our chance because it's going to be the next 10 years or, or nothing, and, and we've got some international competitors that, uh, that have very clearly stated they, they intend to, to do this. And they'll, of course, go set up under the Outer Space Treaty their operational exclusion zones, and some of them kind of like the Outer Space Treaty because it's weirdly vague about what commercial operations mean, and it doesn't allow a mechanism for commercial companies to improve their land and resell it. So as I mentioned in the previous debate, and, and, and Bob and I agree, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, other than perhaps the prohibition on weapons of mass destruction, needs to go. Um, and that's an important part of commercial development because to make Mars work, to make the moon work, we've got to have private property rights and people have to be able to pass on the value of the property that, uh, that they've created to other people or sell it or, more importantly, lend against it. And, uh, and we've, got to, we've got to straighten that out. Business is good in, uh, in commercial space overall. This is from the Space Angels Network uh, Q1 2019 report. Um, Total investment uh, cumulative in uh, in these commercial space ventures is over twenty two billion dollars, and it's going pretty well. There are some folks who think that we might be looking at a, another commercial space bubble, like the one that, that burst in the nineties, or the teeny one from the eighties. Uh, that's possible, but I I am pretty uh, confident that uh, although no market has every company in it uh, succeed, and you don't want that, right? You do not want every company to succeed. Failure is how we learn, and it doesn't mean that the lessons we learned or even the physical investments we made go away, okay? So Relativity Space is using test stands that NASA hasn't been using its dentist. Whose test stands does SpaceX use in McGregor, Texas? The, no, one's built by Beale, uh, Beale Aerospace in, in, in the 90s in, in that uh, uh, abortive attempt to, uh, to launch a commercial space. But this stuff doesn't go away. Um, the team that worked on Rotary Rocket went on to, uh, to form other, uh, other ventures, and Brian Benny, who flew the Rotary Rocket, flew uh, Spaceship One off it, off it scaled. Um, these things, although they may be business failures, are not industry failures. That's okay. That we expect to see businesses be purchased, businesses to go bankrupt, uh, and, and their assets and intellectual property to be distributed. That's all okay. But is everything good? There's something that's been concerning me, and if any of you follow me, you, you, you may know this. When I did my uh, PhD dissertation, I went off and I looked at the number of patents filed by companies in the commercial space industry, because in management scholarship, patent filings are a proxy for innovation. It's how social scientists and management scholarships determine which companies are most innovative. So companies with more patents are more innovative than companies with less patents. So Boeing has 
22,000 patents or something like that. How many does SpaceX have when I searched? One. I found one. Okay. One patent. All right. Um, gee. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Boeing is infinitely more uh, innovative than SpaceX, according to that measurement. The patent system in the, the, in, in the international community is broken because at least one major player simply refuses to pay by the rules. Uh, this is a quote from Elon and Wired. This is a real problem, okay? Uh, and it's not just in the space industry, but it is a challenge in, in, in the space industry because particularly when you've got a government player who feels that they can simply pick and choose technologies around the world and steal them through cyber attacks, uh, uh, on the ground espionage and, uh, and whatever methods they can get exploiting employees and then copy those things and use them for, for their own benefit, um, you reduce the ability to get investment in companies here in the U.S. There's a company not far from here uh, called uh, Cloud Constellation. How many of you know what Cloud Constellation does? All right. So Cloud Constellation is going to put servers up in space so that they'll be more secure because they'll be actually physically isolated from the Earth. Most people don't realize that all cyber attacks don't happen by some kid sitting in a dark room somewhere in, in Russia uh, typing in passwords really fast or, uh, or run, running some sort of script. A lot of them happen with physical access to... Uh, to the infrastructure, the communications infrastructure, and even to the server rooms. It's a whole lot easier to talk your way into a, uh, uh, an IT complex than it is to break your way through the firewall. And uh, I, I'm a, actually a computer network engineer and software engineer by training, and, and I've done that many times. I did a lot of work for, for Kaiser Permanente, who has a very high-tech data center out in Corona, California. I used to make a point of sneaking in just to show that I could, and, and most of the time I could, all right, which wasn't good. So physical security, great idea. If these things are in orbit, that's going to be hard. They're going to communicate with encrypted uh, communications over uh, uh, optical connections. Great idea. Um, they got an investment, $100 million. That's good. Problem is the investment came from a Hong Kong investor, right? Um, I've written a couple articles about this. I am concerned about where investment's coming from uh, and what the, the purposes of that is and how it distorts the commercial space industry. People say to me, but it's just a private Hong Kong investor. Do not be paranoid, Dr. Autry. Let me tell you the story of another private Hong Kong investor that I, I covered in my book, uh, my book, Death by China in 2012. This gentleman here was a private Hong Kong investor who went to the Ukraine, to Crimea, to buy an aircraft carrier from uh, the, the leftover Russian fleet, or the leftover Soviet fleet, pardon me, and he was going to turn it into a floating casino in Macau, right? And so he took $30 million in a bag of cash and, uh, and went off to Crimea and got himself uh, an aircraft carrier. Luckily for us, uh, our, our, our nominal allies, the Turks weren't going to let this thing uh, out of the Black Sea and into the Mediterranean because they, they control the Bosphorus and Dardanelles. Uh, but somebody flew from Beijing with $300 million in development aid for, for Turkey and slush fund for, for uh, obviously, Turkish government people. And, and suddenly, it was OK to let the aircraft carrier into the MAD, where it broke loose from its tug and floated uh, unsecured for a while until they got it back. Anyway, they finally towed it. Did they tow it to Macau? No. They towed it to the Dalian shipyard in, uh, in northern China, where they turned it into an operational aircraft carrier. Surprise, surprise, OK? Uh, and the nominally Hong Kong private investor uh, actually brags about this openly now and talks about how uh, the purchase was aimed at, uh, at conveying the aircraft carrier uh, to, uh, uh, to China. And unfortunately, uh, because of a color problem, you can't see there, but um, this is his brag text, where he's essentially saying um, that I fooled everybody in the world by pretending this was a private investment and I did a great thing for, for my country and I've made an aircraft carrier that can now threaten Vietnam and, and Malaysia and, and the Philippines and all the countries that claim the South China Sea territory that, that China wants down. So we've got to realize what you're dealing with here and it isn't what it seems to be and it isn't what Wall Street investors want you to necessarily believe that it is. So you'll see a lot of companies out there in China that are nominally commercial companies, right? So X space is raised more than relativity space, right? Yay. Okay. So they're flying the, uh, I can't pronounce it, 
Guazhou, Guazhou 1 uh, rocket. Now, the problem with the Guazhou 1 rocket and the rockets on most of these companies that are actually flying, they've got some interesting prototypes of things they're going to do in the future or testing, but what they're actually flying are three-stage solid rockets on mobile launchers. Okay, Where did those come from? They come out of the same factory that the DF-21D comes out of. Okay, They are being built by... Chinese state-owned munitions companies controlled by the PLA and handed off to these nominally commercial companies so that they can have successful flights and announce that their commercial rockets are flying. Their commercial rockets are intercontinental ballistic missiles. There's a couple of problems with this. One is it funds the factory that is developing intercontinental ballistic missiles, and the DF-21D is specifically designed to destroy Amer America's 7th uh, Fleet in the Pacific. That is its only real purpose, to, to put American sailors on the, the bottom of the ocean. So we don't like that. The other problem is, what are they charging for their services? Um, we'll get to that. Okay, what are they charging for their services? $5,000 per kilogram to SSO, okay? The current going rate that companies like Relativity are planning on in order to fund their rounds of investment are more like thirty to $40,000 per kilogram, and that's what Rocket Lab and Virgin Orbit and other companies are probably signing contracts at now. I have had executives from small launch companies tell me they are already losing contracts, particularly in the international market from Europeans, to the $5,000 per kilogram on a free ICBM business. So why is that bad? It's cheaper. Cheaper is always better, right? Not if innovation is crushed because the investment community pulls out. And we've seen this happen before. The Chinese went after the solar photovoltaic market developed by the United States at Bell Laboratories in the 1950s and essentially funded by NASA and other U.S. federal agencies to get solar photovoltaic power to the point where we can actually use it and where we have the promise of using it on Mars. That was all done by U.S. taxpayer money, right? So after U.S. taxpayers done developing that technology, uh, the Chinese, A, hacked into the, the American companies, stole their technology, then exported it to China, dumped the price with money from state-owned banks that don't have to be paid back ever if the government considers it a strategic business and killed off the entire American module and cell business. So that by the time they filed a, a trade complaint that went through the USTR and the WTO and we got in our favor and then in January of 2018, uh, Trump uh, finally put in some tariffs on, on the solar cells and modules. How many American companies did we have? Yeah. Well, we had two in the United States, one owned by the Chinese and one owned by the Germans, but there wasn't a single American-owned company in the United States left in the industry that the American taxpayer paid for. All right. Anyway, these are bad historical lessons. Do not pretend that space is bulletproof. This greatly concerns me, and we need to be honest and open about it. I love international competition. I love what's happening in Luxembourg. I love what's happening in Japan. I'm excited by what I see the UK starting to do. Australia is even getting into to commercial space, but... It isn't commercial space when the government hands weapons to, uh, uh, to, to nominally commercial companies and gives them uh, loans and incentives to, uh, to destroy the American industry. And they want to do this. Why? Because it is strategic to their military and geopolitical endeavors, not because they're excited about the new space age as much. And in my opinion, there are two sets of values that can be carried into the solar system. And we are at this inflection point. This is the 16th century, okay? And at that moment when uh, the European powers decided to go out and essentially settle the world, if you were settled by the Spanish or Portuguese, or if you were settled by the English and the English brought their values of rule of law and parliamentary procedure and the judiciary system, you got a very different economic outcome in those countries than the ones that were brought with the authoritarian system that, that, that came from Spain and the Inquisition and all that. And, and I do not want to see the wrong values carried to space and uh, free Hong Kong. So and LeBron James can, uh, can take a hike. All right. Uh, if you want to follow me, uh, I'm on Twitter at Greg W. Autry. Do not go to Greg Autry because uh, although he's kind of a cool guy and even looks a little bit like me, and he's from California, he's an erotic photographer, and that, that, that is not, not me, okay? 
Sometimes I'm jealous, I guess, but that's not me. All right. Uh, uh, you can also find me in Forbes Space News and Foreign Policy. And if I have a couple minutes, I'll, I'll take a couple of questions. Uh, Greg, I didn't don't know if you um, if you heard my talk on Friday. Uh, probably you were not able to hear it. But I apologize. I was talking I was, about exactly yeah, yeah. what you were talking oh. about about uh, the 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 15th and 16th century. So um, maybe we could talk later. But I just certainly. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I really enjoyed the debate that we had on Friday evening. It was very lively, <laughs> and uh, I was wondering if uh, Bob had a proposal called Moon Direct. And I was, I was talking to him last night and saying, well, all he really needs is to build a lander, and couldn't you go take that and use that for car a cargo delivery to the moon as a service for NASA? Couldn't someone apply for a design grant from NASA to fund research to do that and then rate the thing to be man-rated also and then maybe perhaps build it in a, in a um, blue state and see if you can actually get it down there filming um, uh, Artemis landing, you know, have Jim Acosta and CNN filming uh, Artemis coming down on the moon and saying, hi, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love that. And if you, as you may know, on a separate note, I've worked with uh, uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, Howard Bloom, uh, and to be clear, Newt's obviously Republican. Howard is very Democrat. Uh, uh, General Steve Quas uh, on a, something called the $2 billion moon prize. And we would like to see a... a uh, a motivating prize put up to uh, to get a commercial effort in parallel with Artemis. I, I, I support what they're doing at Artemis. I don't want to try to derail that because I'm afraid if we have too many fights that we'll never get anything out of NASA. But I absolutely support a, a parallel track uh, uh, to do that. And again, I think if we're going to have sustainable development, we've got to have multiple completely re, uh, redundant technology systems. This means launch. Uh, this means transportation capsules and landers and ascent vehicles that do not depend on each other. So if there's a failure anywhere in that chain, People don't get stuck in the moon. Commerce doesn't come to an end. Uh, it doesn't get canceled, right? So, yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, thank you for that. That was really informative. Um, in terms of the uh, American and uh, Chinese trade area, so I used to work for a space company that was wrapped up last month in South Australia. And um, about every six to eight weeks, without fail, I would get an email in my inbox from University of Beijing or Shenzhen or somewhere inviting me to go for a paid um, research. Paid, yeah. Yeah, always. I, I never, never responded. It's pretty obvious what they're doing, but I was just thinking in terms of, uh, obviously you've done some trade work with your government previously. Um, yeah. So you have ITAR and EAR, and, and that's, that's one very effective means, of course, from preventing the control and release and circulation of um, uh, certain assets and materials and information related to those. Um, but uh, we have a piece of legislation in Australia called the uh, Counterterrorism Financing and Anti-Money Laundering Act. And what it means is when you have any money that comes in from overseas beyond a certain amount, I think it's about three million bucks at the moment, it has to go into escrow. It needs to be um, audited by our government um, to ensure it hasn't come from a uh, less credible source. So I was wondering maybe if you had something similar to that here in America or that might be an option to incorporate that into ITAR to prevent Yeah, you know, that's a good point. So first of all, ITAR is good and bad. ITAR has been a real problem for a lot of American companies trying to compete in the international market because it hasn't drawn a really good line between the difference between China, North Korea, Iran, and, say, Canada, right? So I had a friend who's a member of parliament in Canada. Uh, he was the Secretary of State for Asia Pacific for Canada. He was staying at my house. I wanted him to be able to tour the SpaceX facility. We couldn't work that out, right, because, my God, he was a Canadian. Uh, I've been told there are areas in the Virgin Orbit facility Richard Branson's not allowed to go into because he's not a U.S. citizen, right? So that's crazy. We've got to fix ITAR on that end. But, yes, it has protected us in a lot of ways with, with just sending stuff over there. And, yes, on the finance end, that's a much better tool. And I can tell you that the U.S. counterintelligence uh, community has latched onto that and is finding ways to uh, to make it much more difficult for the Chinese to uh, to, to give out uh, free trips to China uh, and then compromise you while you're there and get you to hand over your company to them, which has been been the, the scam. And they're they're working on that. So yeah, that's the best tool is stop the financing. Yes, sir. Hi, Greg. Matt Wise. Uh, first of all, thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Um, with regard to the Outer Space Treaty and um, I think just some of the powers around the around the globe that are probably unlikely to play by those same rules. Do you feel like we're tying our own hands with regard to outer space entrepreneurialism or yeah. even settling the red planet? Yeah, international treaties, what are they worth? Ask the uh, Brits uh, how much time did they spend on the, the Hong Kong Basic Law Treaty and what was that worth? Squat. What was the WTO treaty uh, with China where they said they were going to liberalize and open up their markets worth? Squat. So. 
you don't sign treaties with people who don't believe in the rule of law. They only believe in the rule of power. Uh, and in their case, the purpose of law is to make sure the Communist Party does well, and they don't care about anything else. That is the net good outcome in their, in their world is more control for the Communist Party. So, yeah, I, I think the Outer Space Treaty is a, a problem. If it was signed between us and, and Britain and Japan, you know, it would probably actually work, but it's not. Um, and, in fact, the biggest, only credible part of the Outer Space Treaty I like, because I don't care about the planetary protection part, and I don't care about and don't like the, the lack of, uh, of, of private property rights, um, is the weapons of mass destruction part. And I can tell you that uh, the Chinese are planning to put up, and they've been very clear, large power beaming satellite stations. Uh, and I love space solar power, but space solar power is a dual use technology. Uh, if you're beaming large, uh, powerful 100 megawatt microwave beams down to the, the earth, you can do all sorts of things with them, both good and bad. And I believe that you'll find that the Chinese are going to launch nuclear reactors with power beaming capability because the solar takes too long. And that, in my opinion, is an orbital weapon of mass destruction uh, and a vi clear violation of the Outer Space Treaty. But I, I think they're just going to do that. <sighs> yeah. yeah um, you know, in 2015, uh, the U.S. Congress went ahead and kind of passed a law that expanded our interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty and how we were going to work with commercial actors. It did not go so far, though, as to claim private property rights or sovereignty. Um, you know, I hate to say it, I think we need to do that, but we need to sit down and negotiate a new treaty with countries that, that behave by the rule of law. Uh, I'd love to talk to the Australians, the Japanese, and, and, and the U.K. in particular about that idea. Uh, I think that's a difficult sell. There are people right now in, in, in Europe which has a, a kind of kumbaya view of, of globalism who, uh, who are working on a, uh, a, a plan to kind of sneak the old moon treaty back into to, to place with, a, with a, a resources council in The Hague. And unfortunately, we don't have a representative there. I know they wanted us to have one. Uh, and I know the people that were running it, and I think we should have participated. But uh, it, it's a tricky thing, but mostly we've just got to get our commercial industry going. I think we're going to have to do something that says, yes, you can claim stakes and own property that you improve, and you have the right to, uh, to sell that property. That is just huge, because without that, I don't think the Mars business case closes. <laughs> Bob, let me know when I'm done. Uh, Greg, Bill, Greg, Bill yes. Gardner here. Uh, National Space Society, Space Health and Medicine Committee. Thank you so much. Hold the microphone to your mouth. I can't Thanks hear you. for joining the leadership of the NSS. You've been a great All right. He said, thanks for joining the NSS leadership, and I'm proud to do that. Thank you. And so when you look at the total threat structure to the world and to the population, um, you stated a few. What about the health threat? And this is something that we could cooperate with. What, what is your view of, you know, the fact that the statistics are showing life expectancy has dropped three years in a row, and it's mostly 20 to 30-year-olds? So, you know, there, there are, there's, there's some processes that are underway at NASA to improve health for people going into space. Do you see that as a p potential profit center area of cooperation between us and our erstwhile adversaries like the Chinese and the Russians? to do something useful for space. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean space has so many benefits. It's why I've, I've dedicated my life to it, and I'm sure you have. And, and you know, I'm, I'm really proud to uh, to work with the National Space Society, serve on the board, and as, as vice president of space development there. And I also want to give another shout out to, to uh, Bob Zubrin, who, at the end of his book, you know, um, the case for Mars, he made a point of talking about all the organizations that you could join uh, in order to help promote space. And it is that idea that, uh, that we've got a lot of different people in this community working together that I really respect. So I'm not an expert on the health issues, but you note that the, the declining uh, uh, well, lifespan has a lot to do with, with younger people, actually. It also has a lot to do with men in their 50s, and it has a lot to do in the United States with suicide and drug addiction. Uh, not necessarily just the environmental things that we're subject to. Uh, all in all, technology's helped us live a lot longer. And 
I agree that we've also developed technological threats to our, our lifespan, but the fact of the matter is people are living long and they're living quality. When I see the people that are 80 years old now out golfing and uh, doing the things that they do, when I was young, it was like amazing if somebody was 80 something. It's like, ooh, there's an 80 something year old yeah. person. Uh, it, it, it just the other day, this, this was great. I, 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 I was. So, what do you think of the idea of longevity tourism? People in their 80s and 90s going to the moon and Mars and getting away from it that may gravity help. well. It may not. We don't know. We've got to get there and find out. And one of the things that needs to be done with Gateway, in my opinion, if we do that, is we've got to get some artificial gravity going so we can test what happens to people in different uh, uh, G environments. And that was discussed uh, in one of the, the, the uh, presentations the other day. But that is so critical. We need to know what happens to people in 40% uh, in G and, and 1 16th G. Uh, but anyway. Um, the, the, this great story. A uh, uh, speaker uh, was speaking to uh, to the audience and uh, taking questions, and somebody in the audience said, "Hey, I want to point out that I brought my mom here, and she's 80 years old, and she's seen every one of your shows." The speaker was Alex Trebek of Jeopardy. I went to go see one of his shows uh, because, bless his heart, I, I hope he's with us forever. But you know, he's not well. And and Alex is looking at this guy bragging that his mom is 80 and has watched all the shows for 22 years. And Alex says, "You know, I'm 79, and I have been to all my shows for 35 years, so I'm not that damn impressed, right?" But. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, technology got us there. Uh, people uh, are, are doing well. So it's good. It's not perfect. We can do more. And thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you.